Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Rick Nelson, and owner of the Annapolis Sailing School, along with my wife, uh, Jenny, and uh, coming uh, to you today from uh, the Sail Shed, uh, the Kilbo Club members uh, clubhouse at the uh, uh, Annapolis Sailing School. Uh, I can see I look like a propeller head on this <laughs> with the, uh, the fan in the background. Uh, but I'm here to, uh, to introduce you to today's feature, uh, Kara, the Cat, and the, the Canary. Um, as you may know, the, the motto of the sailing school is uh, uh, seriously fun. And that refers to kind of in-depth learning, uh, but done in an enjoyable way. It takes on a somewhat different meaning now uh, with the coronavirus uh, and that there are people seriously impacted uh, by that and our, our best thoughts go out to those people. But uh, I think fun uh, is important in all this too, uh, in the sense of uh, having uh, hope. And while our vision of fun is really being uh, out in the water with our students, our renters, our Kilbo Club members, uh, it looks like it's going to be at least a, a few more weeks before that's uh, possible. But we thought that uh, for those who uh, are either uh, dreaming of getting their skipper certification or those who just dream of being a passenger on a nice boat, uh, it would be nice to go on a uh, virtual trip. And um, today is the first of those uh, trips that we're, we're going to offer. Uh, Kara, the, the cat and the canary, does not refer to uh, the Kitty Channel on YouTube's latest uh, offering, uh, but instead it really, uh, it's a recounting of the, uh, the voyage that Kara uh, Finneran uh, excuse me, took uh, along with husband uh, Rory, on a 50-foot cat uh, named Purr, going from uh, Gibraltar to the Barbados uh, via the, the Canary Islands. And um, we think that Kara uh, represents uh, uh, all that's good about the, the sailing school. You may remember from last year uh, doing uh, reservations as well as uh, social media. But uh, Kara, along with John and, and Ricky and Andrew and Brenda and Ryan and a host of instructors and, and captains or what I think uh, that along with our, our, our students uh, make uh, the Annapolis Sailing School uh, special. So um, we'd like to uh, embark on this, uh, this uh, voyage, uh, uh, alternatively known as the allure of sailing the Atlantic Crossing. Um, and just uh, a few administrative rules in terms of this uh, being on Zoom. Um, but um, the, the talk will take about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, people can then um, uh, ask questions at the, the end of it. Uh, my uh, instructions just in terms of, of uh, control of this, Kara certainly will be doing it on her end. But um, keep your microphone muted, muted unless you uh, are actively speaking. Uh, as I mentioned, there'll be a separate time for uh, questions. Questions can be asked in the chat if you don't um, uh, have a microphone on your device, uh, otherwise then uh, unmute them. Uh, we're going to record this, so if there's any reason that you, you'd rather not be recorded, then if, uh, don't ask uh, questions, but we can always deal with them uh, offline. Um, so, um, with that, I'd like to, uh, to turn it over to, uh, to Kara and uh, to take us through uh, what was a, a pretty exciting uh, uh, trip across the Atlantic. Kara? Thanks, Rick. Um, thanks to you and the Annapolis Sailing School for letting us get on here and talk at you about our Annapolis, or I mean, sorry, Atlantic crossing. Um, we're pretty excited to have an opportunity to relive the adventure. Um, and Thanks for everybody who came to watch today. Um, it's really good to see some familiar faces in that participants list. Oops, my bad. Um, good to see uh, so many Keelbelt Club members showing up. Um, we just wanted to do a you know, brief interview, or overview of what it was like to cross the Atlantic as crew. We were invited by a Canadian couple, friends of ours that we met um, in Malta a few years back 
Uh, they'd been cruising in the Mediterranean for a number of years and had decided to do their first Atlantic crossing and uh, needed crew for that. So they invited us aboard along with another uh, friend of theirs from the UK. Um, and we just wanna let you know what it was like being out there for, uh, I think it was 16 days um, crossing the Atlantic Ocean. All right, so we're gonna start just giving a brief in, uh, overview of our background uh, sailing. I know many of you have already uh, met me and know my sailing background, but just wanted to go over that really quickly. Yeah, for those of us, for those of you that don't know us, um, I grew up sailing in Michigan, just really casually on the inland lakes, mostly um, really small lakes and small boats. And then got more serious about it in 2012 when I moved to DC and started sailing the Chesapeake on a, a 23 foot boat that I had. Um, and then I simultaneously um, was able to do some offshore sailing as crewing on some boats. And then that led, you know, it snowballs and that led to crewing a Pacific trip in 2016 uh, from Tahiti to Hawaii to Alaska that Kara was able to join for. Um, and then of course, Kara and I uh, got to finally go cruising ourselves on our own boat in 2018, and we took our 36-foot sailboat from Annapolis um, to the Bahamas and back. And that was right before Kara started working for the school. Um, and then, of course, we we got some experience sailing the rainbows and the, and the bigger Benetos at Annapolis Sailing School too. Um, so most of our experience is on the is on the Chesapeake, which we love. Yep, I just um, thought I'd highlight that I. You know, I grew up with a love of water, but I'd never actually started sailing till I met Rory um, in, in this area and started sailing on his 23 foot sailboat on the Chesapeake. And um, my first time offshore was crossing from Hawaii to Alaska on uh, another friend's boat, a 39 foot monohull. And, um, you know, I really became more comfortable sailing on our own boat, our 36 foot boat. Um, you know, became more comfortable at the helm on that boat. And I actually learned just a ton working at the Annapolis Island School, even though I was in the office. Um, you know, I got to watch the instructors do their thing with, from our beautiful view up in that office. And uh, I learned a lot just from watching that. And um, that was my first time taking people out on my own as a skipper. I took some friends out on a rainbow one time and <laughs> really built a lot of confidence that way. So it was with that, um, background that we headed off to the Atlantic. Um, we, as I mentioned, were crewing for Captain Charlie and his first mate, Sue, um, on their 50 foot catamaran Purr. We met them in Malta in 2017 and we just maintained a friendship with them on Facebook for a few years um, while they were continuing to cruise in the Med and we were cruising our boat down uh, the East Coast to the Bahamas and back. Um, Charlie is a very experienced skipper. Sue has um, sailing, you know, experience. She's, I would say, about as confident, competent as me, although she doesn't seem to have the confidence, so she didn't really want to take watches. Um, and then they also invited a fifth crew member, Steve, from the UK, who was another cruiser that they had met uh, sailing through the Med. Yeah, so a little bit more about the boat. Um, she's a 2008 50-foot Katana, a Katana 50, built in France uh, on the Mediterranean. And the owners, Charlie and Sue, they bought her actually in Tunisia, I think in 2014. And, you know, they have an interesting story about that where apparently they got a pretty good deal on her because not a lot of people want to go to Tunisia to buy a boat. Um, so they loved that and they ended up loving the time they spent in Tunisia too. They said it was great. And then um, the past five years or so, they've been just cruising around the Med, hitting all the big spots in the Mediterranean. Um, and that's how we met them in Malta in 2017. Uh, we were on Kara's dad's sailboat and we anchored right next to them. And they were really friendly. They helped us anchor our first time. Um, and we ended up becoming friends with them. And um, turns out they, uh, you know, they wanted to cross the Atlantic, but they wanted extra crew. So we were some of the first people they, they asked and we were super excited to, you know, to get that opportunity. Um, it was our first time sailing a catamaran really at all, other than little Hobies. So 
you're excited to get to sail a catamaran in the ocean. And this boat, I know my catamaran sailing friends, they often um, talk about how the katanas, they have their helm stations outboard. You can see in this photo, you know, unlike a lot of catamarans where the helm is in the center, uh, the katanas have the, the stations, one on each side on the outside. And we really liked that. Um, we, out there in the ocean, you know, it kind of makes you feel a little bit more like you're in a monohull. You're closer to the water and you have the wind in your face. Um, you might even have a flying fish in your face occasionally, as we'll tell you about later. Uh, but it was really luxurious. You know, it had, all, most of the winches were electric. Um, and it was really well set up, I think, for safety and for, for ocean sailing. Um, to take you to the interior of the boat, we'll show you how we live for our, uh, for our whole time on the boat. So, you know, it's a catamaran, so it's split up into a starboard side hull, and that whole starboard side hull is the owner's side. Charlie and Sue slept in the aft section of the starboard hull, and then they had a large head in the forward section of the starboard hull, and a, the shower looked like a shower you'd have in an apartment. It was a nice, big, full-size shower. And then the whole port side was the guest side. So we were in the aft section of the port hull and it shows two single beds there, but it was convertible into one large queen and that's what we did. So we were really comfortable. We had our own head, which was unbelievably nice. And then um, the forward section was where Steve stayed and he had his own bed and his own head. Um, so it was just so nice compared to the monohull trips we had done where pretty much the whole boat was sharing one head. It was just tons of privacy and tons of space. And then that center section, you know, you step up a few steps and you have a, the galley forward, or no, sorry, the navigation table forward, the galley aft, and then that nice sitting area for dining in the corner there. Um, and then you also have the large cockpit aft of that um, where we could also sit outside and eat if the weather was nice. Um, so tons of space for the five of us. It was really, really nice. Um, as monohull sailors, we were super interested. I know S Steve, actually, I, I didn't mention, he was also a monohull sailor. So all three of us, one part of the e excitement of this trip for us was experiencing the catamaran for the first time. Steve actually was considering s making the jump from monohull to catamaran. So he wanted to see how much he would like that. And Rory and I just wanted to see what all the fuss was about. Um, there were a few dif major differences we noticed between offshore sailing on a cat versus a monohull that we thought we'd highlight. Um, for me, the first thing we really noticed on anchor was just how luxurious it was. You know, Rory just mentioned having that pri all that privacy um, and all of that space, plenty of space for me to do yoga. So that was nice. Um, they also had tons of power capacity on the boat, um, which was very nice, but they definitely made use of it. They had on board a coffee maker, sorry, a coffee grinder, um, an electric kettle, an ice cream maker, a bread maker, and a laundry machine, all of which they used on anchor and offshore. Even you know during our 16 day passage, they were using all of those things. So um, you know, for me, just noticing a how much electricity electrical capacity they had, but be um, how much space they had for those types of uh, appliances. Um, both of those things were mind blowing to me. Um, and, 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 and with the laundry, not only the power, but the water capacity, that, um, that was pretty amazing. Um, on the kind of more negative side, it was noisier, I thought, than a monohull. Um, the, when, the, when big waves would come through under the boat, um, they would pass under the bridge and, and, and slap up against the bottom of the boat. And it would make a noise that was like thunder. It would shake the whole um, table and it was just very disruptive. So you'd, you know, you'd be sailing along on a nice day on what would be pr relatively peaceful on a monohull and, and a big wave would just come slap hard on the underbelly of that boat and it would just really shake everything up so it kind of um it was pretty that was destructive um and then the other thing obviously that we noticed was just how fast this boat was um especially 
it's very, you know, it was very noticeable for us going downwind, um, how much it, it reduced the apparent wind going downwind. We could be sailing very comfortably in 30 knots downwind and it would feel, you know, like 15 knots or, or less going downwind. Um, we hit top speeds of 19.9 uh, .9 knots um, during the trip. We had one 200 nautical mile day and our captain, uh, Rory, Steve, and I were all pretty am amused because our captain would be annoyed when the boat was going under nine knots and we were just happy to be going over five knots. <laughs> so that was um, kind of a, an amusing difference for us. Oh, yeah. Action shot here. <laughs> So as far as the route that we took, you know, the first step, we were in Gibraltar to begin with. So the first thing we had to do was also one of the most challenging, which is get through the Strait of Gibraltar. And as some of you probably know, you know, it's a narrow passage. It's eight or nine miles wide at the narrowest point um, there between Gibraltar and Morocco you have on the south side. And, um, you know, you can see Morocco from Gibraltar. It's right there. And you have to time it carefully because there's tides that are always coming in there and the wind pretty much is funneling through those straits, always either funneling in or funneling out. And so we were able to time it so that we had a favorable tide and the wind was funneling, but it was funneling with us going out the strait. Um, but because of that, you know, and the other big challenge is you have tons of shipping traffic. It's one of the busiest shipping channels in the world. Um, so we had, we, we left in the evening and it was getting dark out. Um, and we had up to, up to 45 knots true wind behind us, um, which on that catamaran was nice because it was really, it was only 30 to 35 uh, true or apparent. So we were able to manage it pretty well. Um, and all we had up was the stay sail, no main, no Genoa, just a little stay sail. And we were flying 10, 11 knots downwind. Um, and Kara was steering the whole time through the strait. And Charlie was talking to ships on the radio and we, you know, helping look at the AIS and tell Kara which way to go. So I was really proud of Kara. She did a great job um, handling that, staying cool, even though it was a little bit of a stressful situation. Um, and once we got out of there, you know, we had our first night at sea and it, everything went smoothly. I think we ended up putting up more sail um, because the wind died down once we got out of that funneling effect. And we treated this first leg to the Canaries kind of like a shakedown sail because it was just about 700 miles. Um, so we got to test out how things were gonna work on the longer crossing that was coming up. Like for example, we sailed with a spinnaker up all night and that was the first time the boat had done that. It was the first time Charlie and Sue had done that, but it went really well. And so that gave us confidence to do it on the longer crossing as well. Um, we, we left Las Pont or sorry, we left Gibraltar on January or on December 28th and arrived, arrived Canaries on January 2nd. So we had New Year's Eve at sea, uh, which was cool. I think, I think we popped a, a, bottle, a bottle of champagne. Yeah, I believe we popped champagne and we hand rolled Chinese dumplings. <laughs> Um, to celebrate the new year at yeah. sea. Yeah, we had a dry boat, you know, while we were sailing, but we made a couple of small exceptions like New Year's Eve. Uh, we had a glass of champagne. And then, so we made it to Las Palmas in about four and a half days and uh, just stayed there for a couple of days. It was a pretty quick turnaround. We reprovisioned and um, got to explore Las Palmas a little bit, but then just a couple of days later, we were off for the big crossing. We picked up Steve as well in Las Palmas. Um, and this, so this next leg, you know, it's the big long leg, about 2,700 nautical miles. And it's the traditional milk run trade wind route, right? It's similar to what Columbus and the, the old time navigators used to do. Um, the old saying, the old sailing directions were sail south till the butter melts and turn right, which is pretty accurate, you know, you can do that. You just sail, sail south until it gets warmer and, and turn right and you'll eventually get to the Caribbean. Um, the nice thing, we just happened to get weather that allowed us to take a more northerly route though. We were looking at our forecasts 
on um, predict wind. And we were going to have pretty good wind even, even further north where that red line is. We, didn't, we did not have to go all the way down towards Cape Verde, um, which, you, which you often do have to do to get the, the nice trade wind. So we were able to, to shortcut it a little bit, um, which I think helped our, helped our time. And, and our crossing ended up being 16 and a half days to Barbados. And Kara, take it from there. Um, so I just thought I'd talk a little bit about what it was like on um, our daily life on board. Uh, I'm going to start with provisioning. So Charlie and Sue actually began meal planning and provisioning before we even got um, to Gibraltar where we met them. Um, they surveyed us beforehand and asked us about our meal preferences. And, um, and then when we got there, we also helped them with some of the provisioning. We did some very major grocery runs uh, in Lalinia. That's the um, part of Spain right next to Gibraltar, bordering Gibraltar. Um, we would go there because the groceries were cheaper than Gibraltar. Um, so we did some big grocery runs there. And then again in Las Palmas, Canaries, um, when we stopped there, they brought on way more than was necessary. Um, partly just so that they would arrive in the Caribbean while stocked because groceries can be harder to get there. Um, and they really stocked up with wine, different alcohol as well, because that can be very expensive in the Caribbean. Um, and we think that was part of the reason the boat went slower than the captain wanted. <laughs> um, we were very well provisioned and we were basically eating as we would have on shore. Um, Sue was doing all of the cooking. Um, breakfast was self-serve. We would, every man for themselves in the morning, whoever woke up first would make coffee for everybody else, but then it was just kind of, self-serve. We ate a lot of cereal and granola. Um, we brought pre-made croissants from Spain and stroop waffles, which I don't know if you guys know what those are, but they're a delicious Dutch treat. Um, and we, we ate fruit while it was fresh uh, before we ran out of that. Um, but then Sue would cook all of our lunches and dinners and she made very fancy cooking at sea from my perspective. Um, every meal involved a side salad, she made us chicken schnitzel. We had eggs Benedict one day. Um, they had a grill on their stern railing and they grilled meats a couple of times. Um, so we were eating very well, probably better than I normally eat in my just regular life without Sue there to cook for me. So that was nice. And she also did desserts almost every night. She did fresh ice cream in that ice cream maker I told you about. Um, fresh breads, cakes, apple crumble. Um, so it was definitely kind of luxurious in that sense compared to our experience uh, offshore on monohulls. Um, and then we also did a lot of fishing to get, uh, you know, fish to eat. <laughs> we caught five mahi-mahi, no, six mahi-mahi that we um, took turns filleting and we made into a number of different types of meals. We made pokey, poke with the mahi-mahi, mahi-mahi, we made ceviche. We grilled it, we fried it. I think Sue may have made fish balls with it at one point. So um, we had a lot of fun with that. Um, we would put the lines out in the morning uh, at the dawn watch, whoever was on the dawn watch would throw the lines out. We would pull them in at dusk. And anytime there was a fish on the line, it was this huge production. Um, you know, it'd be an all hands on deck situation where somebody's trying to reel in the fish, whoever's at helm is trying to slow the boat down as much as possible. Um, to get that fish on board and it was always very exciting. Um, mostly we caught those six mahi-mahi, but we did get one, you guys, humongous blue marlin on a line at one point. And we thought it was a shark at first. We did not know what was happening. And we got it close, we realized it was a blue marlin. We had a huge discussion while the poor fish was on the line about whether or not to bring it on board. We decided to try to bring it on board, but it, um, it was too heavy for our hook and it just, got free anyway and swam off, um, which was probably better because we didn't have the freezer space for that. Again, we had provisioned a ton. Our freezers were already full of meat. So, um, and then we did catch a barracuda as well, which we just, we just cut that buddy free. Um, so that was fun. The fishing was very fun. And um, yeah, we got a lot of mahi mahi out of that. Yeah, so we kept a watch schedule, you know, the way we did it, uh, we had five people on the boat and 
Sue was essentially the full-time chef. So she was cooking, you know, at least two meals a day um, and doing all the dishes and not taking any watches. That, um, that's what she wanted to do. And it worked really well. You know, we were all well fed and she got a full night's sleep every night. Well, most nights, um, you know, she would be up helping if on nights when we needed it. But um, Kara, myself and Steve were in a full watch rotation where we were three on six off the whole time. With, and then Charlie, the captain would just do midnight to three every night. And that's all, that's the only official watch he had. And then he was kind of on call the rest of the time. And that worked pretty well. Cause that gave us, you know, it was essentially um, three on nine off for us at night. We got some good sleep and then, um, you know, it worked out. It really worked out. Um, and then to talk a little bit, Oh, as far as the, the watch routine too, um, like Kara alluded to, I mean, we got in a, a nice routine after a few days where in the, the dawn watch would, you know, turn the, turn the navigation lights off, change the brightness on the screens, um, put the fishing lines out, you know, and then in the evening you do the opposite. So it's amazing how quickly you get into those daily routines of um, what you have to do. As far as the sails we had, you see in this photo, the one on the left, that was one of our two spinnakers we had. You know, this is traditionally a downwind route in the trade winds. So we knew that we were going to be working our spinnakers pretty hard. And sure enough, you know, this was the bigger of the two spinnakers. And we, we started off with this one and we were sailing it, you know, we were flying it 24 seven for a while, um, being real careful with chafe on the sheets and tack lines. Um, the boat has dagger boards. So downwind, we had to, we didn't do much with the dagger boards other than we had to lower them a bit at times just to make sure they weren't interfering with the spin sheets and the tack lines um, on the deck. Um, we had a brand new square top mainsail, which was really nice, really powerful sail. You know, we had to be conservative with it because it's so big and so powerful. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time with that mainsail reefed. And we spent a lot of time with not flying the mainsail, like you see in this picture. You know, if we had a spinnaker up, um, we usually didn't have the mainsail up. We didn't really need it downwind. Um, on this catamaran, one of the unique things was, you know, you couldn't really get the boom very far out because of the, um, the swept back spreaders and the fact that you have those shrouds right there. So downwind, we usually just didn't mess with the, the mainsail. We also had a self-tacking staysail, which is the one you see in the, on the right side right there. And that was a nice older sail, you know, it was kind of old and a little bit moldy, but it was our workhorse when the wind picked up. We would just put that, pull that out and, you know, attack itself. And it was really nice when the wind was higher. Um, and we could, and we also had a brand new code zero on an outer, you know, furler um, that we had to be a little bit careful with because it was brand new and we didn't want to damage it. Um, so we only flew that when the apparent wind was below 20 knots. Um, and we also, you know, we got to, we got a lot of experience flying these spinnakers on a catamaran, which was nice. Um, you have a tack line on coming from each hull and a sheet coming from each hull. And so to jive, all you do is, you know, pull, let one tack line out, pull in the other tack line, let one sheet out, pull in the other sheet. And, you know, jiving it was really easy and, and pretty simple compared to most monohulls. Um, some of the fun things we did aboard um, included stopping to swim. I don't have a photo of that, but we had one relatively calm day that we decided, um, and it was uh, as things were warming up, so we decided that we wanted to stop and take a swim. Um, we did what our captain described as a catamaran heave to, which Rory might be able to explain to you. Um, but we, so we slowed the boat down, put out a safety line, and we all jumped in one person on the boat at all times, of course. Um, but it was kind of funny because the day before we decided to jump in the water, Rory had seen a shark. So that was on our radar. Um, Rory was the only one that saw it, I think. So I was pretty jealous, but he saw a big old shark just kind of hanging out near one of the holes for a while. Um, we didn't see as many dolphins as I expected. When we had sailed from Hawaii to Alaska, we saw a ton of dolphins. So I was expecting to see all of the dolphins and our captain saw a couple, but I never saw any. Um, but what we saw a ton of, you guys, flying fish. Every single day, just 
thousands of flying of fish and every night as well. Um, every morning we would wake up with a handful of flying fish dead on deck. And as it turns out, um, I have a theory that they can't see where they're going at night, which is why they end up on the boat, but they also ended up flying into our, uh, our buddy Steve's face one night. Um, we heard some ruckus up on, <laughs> on deck, some yelling, and it turns out he was hit in the face with a flying fish. Um, that may have happened twice, we can't remember, but it certainly happened at least the once. So word of warning when you're out there on the Atlantic Ocean at night, um, you know, you might be hit in the face with a flying fish. Yeah, we've heard of people getting black eyes. You know, if you're sailing at 10 knots and, that, and the fish is coming at you at another 10 knots, you could have a 20 mile an hour collision with the fish. Um, and when Steve got hit, apparently it kind of got caught in his jacket or on his chest somehow. So, you know, he gets hit in the face and then he just hears a flapping and it's dark. So he didn't know at first what it was. So he was, he was freaking out for a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we saw a few cargo ships. We didn't see a whole lot of traffic out there, but a few cargo ships, one passed somewhat mm -hmm. close by. Um, we saw one cruise ship just from the distance. We could just see a lot of light on the horizon, um, but we did pass close enough to one other sailing vessel um, that they were on our radar. And again, we could just see their lights in the distance. Um, so not that close, but it was kind of cool to see another sailboat out there. Uh, Rory actually got on the radio and said hi to them. Turns out it was a Welsh couple also heading to Barbados and just the two of them on their 35 foot monohull. So that was really cool. Um, and then another fun thing we did was stargazing. Uh, we had one of those star finder apps on our phone and uh, at night we would try to, we were waiting until we could get far enough so south to see the Southern Cross. And so that was really exciting when we finally were able to see the Southern Cross. Um, that was my first time seeing it. And I think uh, Sue's first time as well. So we were pretty excited. Um, and then another thing, fun thing we did was throw a, mes a message in a bottle off the boat. Yeah, yeah, I, my good friends, I got this idea from them. I mean, I know it's pretty, pretty uh, popular, but they, my friends threw a message in a bottle when they were crossing the Atlantic to Europe several years ago. And, you know, a couple of years later, they got an email from a fisherman in, I think, Belize, uh, who found the bottle and sent them an email. So I wanted to do the same thing. We wrote a little note, we put our email addresses in there and the date and our GPS coordinates. And, you know, so we're hoping we threw it in just a little bit past halfway uh, so we're hoping someday we'll hear from somebody who finds it. Um, some of the less fun aspects of the trip uh, that I thought I'd share with you all. First of all, it was much colder than I expected for most of the trip. Um, I had tried to research what it was, what temperatures we're going to be looking at. And I was having a hard time finding information about that. Um, but I felt pretty confident that it was going to be mostly a warmer trip. And we packed pretty light, uh, brought a lot of clothes appropriate for Barbados. Um, and only, I think, one set of wools, like one, you know, my foul weather jacket, which you see me wearing here. Um, but actually, so one of the surprises um, that happened up front was that Charlie broke his foot <laughs> um, handling that big new mainsail that they bought. Um, and that delayed them getting out of Gibraltar. So that's actually why we met them in Gibraltar. We were originally planning on meeting them in the Canaries. And um, we didn't change what we had packed when we changed our trip to going to Gibraltar. So we ended up in Gibraltar in December and it was a lot colder than expected. I was wearing the same one warm outfit that I traveled in from Michigan, like every single day that we were in Gibraltar, waiting for a part for that mainsail to show up. And then uh, we got, we left, we went to Las Palmas. We were all excited thinking it was going to be way warmer in Las Palmas. And it just, it really wasn't. Apparently it was un, uh, unseasonably cold there. Um, it was unusually cold weather for them that they were experiencing. So again, just wearing my one sweatshirt that I brought the whole time. And then we depart Las Palmas. We're every day waiting for it to just warm up and it really wasn't. So every single night during my night watches, I was wearing this fall weather jacket over my sweatshirt, over my follies, leggings over 
dolly leggings and um, wrapped in a blanket usually at night as well. So uh, that was kind of, that caught me by surprise. We didn't really get to throw on our warm weather, warm clothes, warm weather clothing, um, which is mostly what I packed until like a few days out from Barbados. So that was um, somewhat comical in hindsight comical during the time it was kind of unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, we packed really light. You know, one thing we realized when we got on the boat was, wow, this isn't a monohull. Like we could have brought a lot more clothing and um, we ended up with empty lockers in our, in our cabin because we just we packed really light and uh, we underestimated how much storage space we had. Yeah. Um, another of the harsh realities we faced was um, kind of overworking our sails a little bit, um, especially with spinnakers. So Rory was talking about how we would leave uh, the spinnakers up overnight. We had um, our big spinnaker going 24 seven for a, a while, for a long run until it blew out in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> so that was an all hands on deck situation. We just heard Steve up on deck, it was his watch, yelling about, yelling profanities really, and everybody you know, ran up on deck and it turns out the sail had blown out. And so most of us had to go forward and bring it down. It actually came down pretty easily. So that was nice, but that was kind of, you know, accelerated heart rate moment. Um, and so then after that, we were left with our storm spinnaker, our smaller spinnaker, and we were using that just as much. And that was actually, well, I, were both spinnakers kind of old? Yeah, both the spinnakers had come with the boat, Yeah, so they were both older. So um, it was not that surprising when they blew out, but the yeah. second spinnaker also, we're blaming Steve, you guys, it was also Steve's watch. Um, he didn't quite know what had happened, something kind of went weird with the sail, and then, um, and they just noticed some line was kind of weird forward, um, but we were switching watches, I was relieving Steve, Steve went down to bed, and the captain decided to go forward to see what was going on with this weird line up there. And um, he starts to unwrap it. And it was something, you know, it was, it was whatever that line was, it was the only thing holding the spinnaker together anymore. Because as soon as he unwrapped it, that spinnaker blew out. And again, all hands on deck, pulling it down. Um, and again, at night. <laughs> so kind of. You know, it feels way more, everything feels very, way more intense at night on a sailboat in the ocean. Um, so after that, uh, the captain jerry-rigged a, a wing-on-wing situation. He didn't have a, a spinnaker pole. Um, so we used a line to hold one of the, uh, to hold one of the head sails out um, to windward and the other head sail out um, on the other side to create kind of a spinnaker effect. Yeah, they ran a line from the a cleat on the bow to a winch in the cockpit and then um, attached, the, attached the clue of the staysail to that and th they were able to hold the staysail out to windward that way and have some, you know, prevent some shock loading that way. And it worked out really well. Then we had the code zero on the other side and had a wing and wing, you know, with the two head sails for the final part of the trip. Um, it was funny though, because in hindsight we realized with the weather we had, we had lighter wind towards the end and heavier wind at the beginning. You know, we really should have started out with that wing and wing setup and finished with the spinnakers. Um, but, you know, that's only in hindsight that we knew that. Yeah, a couple, you know, kind of lessons learned there. I mean, on the one hand, it does highlight the ingenuity of sailors coming up with that wing and wing setup. Um, we were all pretty excited about it. Um, but on the other hand, it really, emphasizes how an Atlantic crossing is very hard on the boat. You know, your boat's not used to sailing 16 days in a row, just completely um, without stop, without taking any breaks to take care of the sails and everything. So you really have to be watching for chafe. You really have to be watching for um, how hard that is on the boat. So kind of one of the lessons mm -hmm. learned. Um, and then, uh, I just, I guess one other thing that kind of went wrong is um, with the communication systems. Uh, we, our captain splurged on the like creme de la creme of, of you know, communication systems for at sea. He had a, a SAP, um, Iridium Go satellite messaging system. So we were supposed to be able to just download an app on our phones 
and um, and and be able to send unlimited numbers of emails via that. He had, he had paid for like the unlimited data package on that. I can't imagine what he paid for that. And um, the Iridium Go people put out an update for that app just before we were leaving port. So like those of us who updated our phones, our you know our apps on our phones while we were still on land, um, we received that update and we get out at sea and it turns out that update was buggy. And so those of us who had done that app update um, were unable to use the email for the entirety of our 16 day passage. So we were a little angry with Iridium Go about that. I think we tweeted, tweeted some frustrated tweets at them when we got back to land on the other side, but um, you know, not the worst thing in the world, but kind of a surprise. <laughs> Um, so that's basically uh, the end of what we had prepared to say. If you've got any questions for us, we'd be happy to answer those. Um, and you can use the wave your hand or raise your hand feature, or you can uh, type it in the chat if anybody has any questions. Well, I'll just say that uh, it seemed like quite an adventure. It was. It certainly was. Um, this last photo at the end is from the beginning of our trip while we were still in Gibraltar. This is um, looking over the Bay of Gibraltar and one of the Macaques up on the mountain. And you can see all the ship traffic out there. Wow, good. There's a lot. It was a game of Frogger getting out of that situation. Yeah, it's funny. I was coming to Rory and Karen. It, to think of all the, the naval history that goes through there, you know, from uh, kind of Lord Admiral Nelson's uh, Navy with uh, you know, the, the French and the Spanish to World War II. It's, it's amazing that <laughs> it's all constricted to that nine mile uh, space there. Yeah, we were able to hike up to the top of the rock in Gibraltar and, you know, that's where the monkeys are. And we got to see some of the old British military outposts there. And, you know, they have the, you can see where they have the big cannons. Um, it's really neat. Thanks, Kate and Elliot. It's really great to hear from you guys. Glad you guys uh, joined in. We miss you too. <laughs> um, okay, good question. We have a question about um, the electricity. Yeah, this boat, you know, it used a lot of electricity and it produced a lot of electricity. We had a bunch of solar, we had a big solar, panel set up on the davits, and then we had a couple more solar panels up on forward on the deck. Um, and then on top of that, they had pretty beefy generators on each of the two diesel engines. And they had a, in the port side engine room, which was the engine rooms on this boat were nice and big and you could get down in there and have a lot of space. So in the port side engine room, they had a, a Fisher Panda, you know, diesel generator. And that was their primary electrical source. They would run that, you know, a couple hours a day. And then they had, and they had a lithium ion battery bank, which was huge. So they had lots of capacity. Um, we did end up running into a few issues. You know, we, we learned a lesson about making sure all your stuff is rock solid before you leave. Cause we had a, we had an issue with the generator overheating at one point. And then we found out that there were some longstanding issues with the, um, with the alternators too. So we, we had a little bit of stress out there because we're like, all right, how are we going to produce electricity if the generator and the alternators are problematic and the solar panels, you know, don't really make enough. Um, but we ended up being fine. We ended up, you know, using one of the alternators to make some juice and turning off the extra fridge that we had, the beer fridge, <laughs> and we were fine. Um, but yeah, they had, they had a nice setup. The generator was really nice. We weren't able to do the laundry during that time, so that was a bummer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's see, I think Miranda had a question. Sailing east to west. When sailing east to west, would you have to make a series of tacks at timed out period at periodic intervals? So um, because we were on the trade winds route, uh, we actually didn't need to do a whole lot of tacking. Um, you know, we were just sailing basically downwind for almost the entirety of those 16 days. Um, so you could basically just be on the same tack. Uh, we did sail changes 
obviously because our spinnakers were blowing out, but um, we would basically, like if the wind shifted just, just so that it was too far to one side for us to, you know, use the spinnaker, then we would bring out, you know, the, the head sail and, and sometimes the main if there was, if the wind was light enough for that. Um, but yeah, we didn't really have to do a lot of tacking until the end when we were getting closer to the island. Yeah, we jived a few times. You know, we had um, predict wind weather forecasts. So we were, the skipper was kind of paying close attention to that and trying to see where we would have stronger wind. Uh, we were basically always looking for stronger wind on that catamaran and going downwind. You know, we were, I think we would prefer 30 knots true because the way that boat was set up. Uh, so we were tacking around, jiving around a little bit, looking for wind. Um, but for the most part, yeah, we were just on the rum line kind of heading right for Barbados. Yeah, John asked, um, how long did we sleep after reaching Barbados? Um, so we, we arrived at Barbados in the evening and um, Charlie and Sue knew some friends in the Anchorage. So they came right over after we dropped anchor and we were up a bit late um, celebrating our arrival. And, you know, and then we got some sleep, but I don't think we got enough sleep before deciding that, you know, very excited to be on land, go ashore, experience the Barbadian cult, the Bayesian culture, they, they call it Bayesian. Um, and it turned out there was a festival that day. So we went to the festival and I think it was the second night where we really um, kind of crashed hard after all of that celebration. Um, but yeah, it's pretty exciting getting to land after all those days at sea. Uh, let's see, can you talk about how you manage the work to navigate and the work with the weather? Yeah, um, we had a nice PC based chart plotter on the boat. So he was running a PC running time zero software, which I had never used before, but it's a nice, you know, almost commercial grade chart plotting application for a PC. Um, so we were able to overlay our radar and our AIS data and all that to, to the PC chart plotter. Um, and we also, you know, Kara and the influence of, that we had, we were, we convinced the captain to actually keep a pencil and paper log too, because we were used to doing that. And we love that as a backup and as a traditional fun thing to do, you know, you come off watch and you, you log it in a, with a pencil and paper. Um, so we were able to do that as a backup, um, but primary navigation was just GPS and, and on the PC-based chart plotter, um, you know, with our radar data and our AIS. Mm -hmm. And he was able, so although we weren't able to use the Iridium Go for anything with our apps, the captain actually hadn't updated his phone, so he was able to um, utilize the Iridium Go, and the main thing he was using for it for was downloading the weather data. Right. Um, that would take hours uh, to download. It was a very small file, but from the satellite, it would take a couple hours to download like a few kilobytes. Yeah, and then he had a nice um, autopilot system. So there's actually an autopilot in the starboard side and an autopilot on the port side. So we had a redundant autopilot, and, which we ended up using. We did end up switching and using the backup autopilot towards the end of the trip. Um, but you know, we, we let the autopilot steer most of the time, but whenever the conditions kicked up to over 20, 25 knots, you know, we would hand steer just to take that, take the load off the autopilot. And you could control the autopilot from inside at the helm, at the navigation table or outside. Um, it was all connected. And yeah, the, the captain was downloading weather from predict, from predict wind. And then that would give you kind of a, a computer based, um, route that you know that it's telling you the input are polars from the boat you know the data from how for how fast the boat should go and any at any point of sail and so it kind of tells you all right head this way that's going to be your fastest way to go we were always we were every day pretty much we were updating that and, and trying to follow that as best as we could mm -hmm. did you run radar at all times and if so did you pick up hazards that were not on ais yeah we did you know we had the electricity to do it so we had the radar on at all times you know, especially at night, we were paying attention to it, making sure uh, that there weren't any floating containers out there or fishing boats. Um, we didn't pick up anything on the radar that was mysterious, I don't think, but we did pick up a mysterious AIS signal. Um, it was just a weird kind of string of characters 
um, for a name and it was, and it was moving a little bit and it was only like a mile away. So we ended up veering off course and going and investigating this mystery, mystery AIS signal. And it turned out to be um, a little yellow scientific buoy that was drifting. And um, we looked it up and it was some kind of science buoy. Um, but we got a close look at it because we wanted to make sure it wasn't, you know, a man overboard from some other boat or, or something. Um, that was kind of exciting. Um, great questions. How did you prepare for man overboard? And did everybody have a PLB rules for PFD and lines? Yeah, so uh, we were pretty careful about it, pretty mindful of it. You know, we did have good um, spin lock deck vests, uh, PFDs that we would always wear at night. And we wore it a lot of the time during the day too, with a harness and a tether. And then before we left Gibraltar, we installed jack lines on the boat, going all the way to the bow, to the cockpit, so that when we did go forward at night, or if the weather was kicked up, you know, we could clip in. Um, we did have AIS-based man overboard beacons that we could, I would grab, you know, we only had two for the whole boat, but whoever was on watch would grab that and put it in their pocket so that if they did go over, at least you'd have that um, and the boat would know where you were and, and it'd be much easier for the boat to come back and get you. Now that relates too to the mystery AIS signal we saw because the lesson we learned there is how hard it is to see something and find something in those waves, um, even if you have an AIS signal, you know, we had an AIS signal for that buoy and it's still, it would take us several minutes of careful looking in the middle of the day to find it. So that was definitely reinforcing, hey, ha have a PLB of some sort, um, definitely worth it. Sarah asked, uh, what's your conclusion about a catamaran? Are you ready to switch from a monohull? Um, I'm not sure what Steve's takeaway was, but I think for Rory and me, uh, we're not likely to switch to a catamaran anytime soon. Um, that uh, again, like that noise was really jarring. The, the waves crashing against the bottom of the boat, um, and then for me, I would say that not. It wasn't even necessarily catamaran versus monohull, but just the size of this 50-foot boat. I don't need a boat that big. To me, it seemed very excessive. The winches were huge, the mainsail's huge, everything. I mean, it's just much harder. Um, although he set, had it really well set up for short handing, everything's so much harder to do when, when everything weighs, you know, when the sails weigh that much. And um, I, I, I prefer a smaller boat, a, a simpler system. Yeah, one, one advantage we had of the electric winches that I realized was, you know, you could sit on the starboard side helm and then, um, you know, adjust the winches on the port side because all you had to do was hit a button. So it was definitely set up for, for ease of use and single handing or double handing. But yeah, the, there's tons of, you know, the pros and cons to the catamaran. We loved the speed of it. It was so fast and the light wind. Um, but other than that, you know, we think we're still monohull sailors. Yeah, the cat, I mean, it's great on anchor. I, I will say that though. I mean, it's so comfortable and, and with more people and the privacy was great. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was fun. I liked crewing on it, um, but I don't know that I would get myself a catamaran anytime soon. Uh, what were the highest seas you experienced? Oh, we got, you guys, we had some high seas going on um, coming out the first several days, I think. Uh, leaving the Canaries across to Barbados. Um, what, what would you say? We were talking about like 12 foot waves. Yeah. I think like 12 foot waves, um, which uh, this is something, yeah. I mean, in the catamaran, first of all, you're here, like it's very violent against the bottom of the boat. And um, I just don't feel like it kind of cut through the waves as nicely as a monohull does. Although, well, going downwind, I don't know, the monohull probably wouldn't have been handling that super well either. Um, but those 12 foot waves were very unpleasant. Um, it was exhausting for those days. Uh, it, it lasted like three or four days and, be hand steering. and we were hand steering because the auto helm wasn't handling it that well. And when the camp captain was super worried about breaking the auto helm, which is a fair worry. So we were kind of hand steering for like, you know, our entire three hour sh shifts each time. And um, it was pretty exhausting. I think emotions were a little bit high during that time. <laughs> um, 
Did you note any surprising set and drift observations that would make navigation a challenge in a boat with a simple set of nav? Tracks? Um, no, you know, I think the only time we had a significant current was leaving through the Strait of Gibraltar. And as I understand it, as I understand it there, you pretty much always have a, a current going into the med. Um, and you just have points where that current is weaker and stronger. Um, so we were able to leave at a point where it was weaker, um, but the wind was with us. So it was wind against tide going out that straight. And that's part of the reason it was a little bit rough. Um, but other than that, on this passage, um, we didn't have too much uh, current to worry about. How was the electricity produced? Assuming a generator, how much fuel was burned each day? Yeah, so that generator, the nice thing about it was it just sipped diesel, you know, it was tied into the boat's main diesel tanks. And I forget the exact consumption rate, but it was, it was um, minimal, it was negligible. Mm -hmm. um, and we carried, I believe, 400 liters of diesel and 400 liters of water, you know, so about 100 gallons. Um, and we barely used any of it. We got to Barbados with those tanks mostly full. Might have time for one more question. And if there aren't any more questions, then you guys, thank you so much for um, participating in this. It was really fun sharing this with you. And again, just really nice to see you all again, um, even though it's virtual. <laughs> yep. Well, if I might uh, say, uh, this is Rick Nelson again. Uh, thank you to Rory and Kara. That was uh, it was uh, fascinating and uh, kind of kind of inspires us to uh, want to get out in the water. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it because we are planning to do another one um, going in the opposite direction. Uh, we had uh, people from the Annapolis Sailing School that helped transition a boat from Annapolis to Australia. And uh, we're going to queue that up. And so uh, be on the lookout for that. We'll do it in the same uh, format. Um, and your feedback, too, in terms of time of day, uh, things that are discussed, uh, anything that you have uh, would be helpful. Um, also be on the lookout. There's some other things we're, we're going to be doing. One is, I'll call it 10 questions with a, an African sailing school captain, but really about how they got into sailing and uh, what they like about it, tips for, for students. We plan to do that and maybe some uh, educational uh, courses. Let's see how quickly uh, Ricky can tie knots uh, on, a, uh, on a video. But uh, anyway, we look at uh, staying in touch with you. And then also check just in terms of updates in terms of uh, the school and its opening. Obviously, we're waiting to see what Governor Hogan does and how open it is. But I think at, at a minimum, um, being out on a rainbow and sailing uh, with one other person that you know um, is a, a great way of of keeping social uh, distancing and yet uh, enjoying the outdoors. So uh, we expect uh, rentals and Kielbo club members to be able to, uh, to get out. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And uh, until then, everyone uh, be safe and, and thank you. I want to add in one more thing here, Rick. Sure. You guys want to rewatch anything that uh, Karen Rory talked about or you missed her answer to a question? Um, the recorded lecture will be posted maybe in a day or so. So you guys can always go back and watch it again. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Ryan, for your help in setting this up. Thank you. All right. Good day, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Have a great weekend. Bye. You too.